April meeting with the Bob Natural History Group. Um, delighted to welcome Dr. Gustav Sharma tonight to talk about snow leopards. He's been working with the Snow Leopard Trust since 2007, and he currently serves as Assistant Director of Conservation Policy and Partnerships. And since 2014, he also serves as the International Coordinator of the Global Snow Leopard and Ecosystems Protection Program. His lecture tonight is going to be on snow leopards, the ambassadors of the mountains of Central and South Asia. I'd now like to hand you over to Dr. Sharma. Thank you, Valerie. Thank you very much and good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us on uh, a Sunday evening. I believe it's just started to become a holiday uh, out there. So thank you for joining us on a holiday. Um, let me see if I can share my screen. I'm assuming you can see my screen now. If you can, please let me know so that I can move on. Yep. Excellent. All right. So, yep. Thank you one more time for inviting me to the Dubai Natural History Group to talk about the snow leopard and why we call the snow leopard as the ambassador of the mountains of Central and South Asia. To do that, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you out of Dubai, uh, where I believe most of you are joining from today. Uh, we'll take you all the way to Asia, and in Asia, I'll take you to this beautiful valley in Chitral in northern Pakistan. Now, the Okay, so the reason I'm going to do that is uh, because I would like to share with you the story of Bayad e Khosher. Uh, Bayad e Khosher was a snow leopard made famous uh, by the BBC film uh, Beyond the Myth. And she was a special snow leopard who would spend a lot of time just being visible to people and, and almost breaking the spell of being the ghost. Now, her, her, her uh, ranging and behavioral patterns were quite intriguing. She used to spend several weeks next to uh, busy roads in Chitral. Uh, what it did was it allowed numerous people to not only see her, but also film and photograph her. And it would, it, she, she really allowed people who, uh, who would have just heard of a snow leopard, uh, but have never seen it before. So the Snow Leopard Trust in the nine, uh, uh, it, it, it had an active programmatic partnership in Pakistan uh, since 1995. And when Bayad was collared as part of the Snow Leopard Trust's research program in 2005, people, including media, spared no words uh, criticizing it. Uh, we did receive a, a, some hate mail for tagging a Snow Leopard with what was called a very ugly collar. The argument was that a snow leopard that could be observed from the roadside for extended periods did not need a collar. Now, I think the filmmakers were also upset about the collar uh, and those ear tags spoiling the visuals. But uh, I think to put it rather softly, uh, resistance to science and breakthrough in knowledge um, has also, it, it's, it's not a new thing apparently. Um, anyway, uh, Bayad wore that collar for about a year, uh, and this was 2005, uh, early days of, uh, uh, of this particular technology, and it was not so well, very well developed, so her collar failed on one front, which was that of communicating with the satellites, but what it still did, it continued to communicate with the GPS satellites and recording uh, and saving her movement data on board. And she would, her caller would do this every few hours. The caller also had a radio transmitter that could be used to hear a radio signal from the caller, but then it required the straight of her to be in the straight line of sight. And I am yet to come across a person who is fit enough to be able to keep a snow leopard in their line of sight for extended periods, especially when that's the kind of a landscape where a snow leopard might live in. 
so much so that uh, the first person to have done his PhD on snow leopards, uh, Dr. Raghu Chundavat, who you see in the screen, uh, he actually had to discontinue his plan to color snow leopards after coloring one in Ladakh. And he claimed that he was ending up estimating his own home range than that of the snow leopard. So it was sort of a futile exercise. Uh, anyway, back to Bayad. Uh, one year later, uh, uh, at least one of the devices on the collar worked and the collar dropped off in the remote mountains of Northwest Pakistan. But as you can see, this is the kind of landscape that it fell in. It took the field teams uh, three agonizing months to retrieve the collar. But uh, when her data was downloaded on the computers, we found something magical. That one cat, that one snow leopard bayad who was spending weeks in front of a busy road was covering an area we had absolutely no clue about, belonged to her. She was traveling across ridge lines, canyons, pastures, valleys, villages, settlements, uh, and much more. Uh, what, we, what we realized, what we found with her data was that she was ranging across 1,400 square kilometer. Not just that, she was regularly crossing the border to go to Afghanistan and back. Bayad was one of the first snow leopards to tell us that we needed landscape level conservation approach and that we needed to look at uh, beyond what we call as human-made boundaries. Just give me a second, I'll uh, set the... Okay, I think it... You guys are, okay. are you seeing the animations all right or are they jarry? I believe they should be fine. That's good. Okay, excellent, thank you. Right, so yeah, so Bayad is not the only snow leopard to have done that. Technology has improved many fold ever since and people have studied snow leopards in other countries to find out that uh, cats in Mongolia cross over to Russia, those colored in Nepal, move between India and China, those colored in Tajikistan cross over to Afghanistan and all the way back to Pakistan and so on. So. We have over the years realized that uh, as a species whose one third uh, of the distribution range is within 100 kilometers from international borders, snow leopards move between countries without the need of passports or visas. Of course, as long as those borders are not fenced. And that's one of the reasons why we call the snow leopard as the real ambassador of the trans of transboundary cooperation in Asia's high mountains. Now let's dive a little deeper and take a look at what makes snow leopard a snow leopard. And uh, to begin with, it's a species that thrives in what is known as one of the world's most hostile and treacherous mountains. It is an evolutionary marvel. Uh, that is almost custom designed by evolution to survive in these vertical cliffs and uh, with thin oxygen and extreme temperatures. I'll just give you an example. A recent publication investigated just how the forelimb of a snow leopard has evolved with functional adaptations. It examined the way these adaptations balance demands of head first descent, pouncing, climbing across rocky terrain, restraint of large prey, rapid pursuit, and navigating deep snow. Now, be it the small bony clavicle providing greater stability to the forelimb or the broad and fleshy intrinsic muscles of the palmar manus, which is the palm or the, uh, the paws, uh, just to enable them to walk on soft snow, every element of just its forearm uh, is as if adapted to rule the world's highest mountains of Central and South Asia. Now, um, snow leopard also wears an invisibility cloak that makes it invisible to the eye. For instance, uh, you all should be able to see an ibex at the lower left corner. Uh, that's one of the primary snow leopard prey. Uh, but this ibex, whose life depends on its ability to spot the snow leopard, has absolutely no clue where the snow leopard is. And to not spend too much time on this image, let me just show you where the snow leopard actually is. 
but do notice where the IBIX is looking at, and that's where the snow leopard is. So clearly this IBIX uh, has absolutely no clue where the snow leopard is, and this is what gives the snow leopard the name. Uh, it's uh, uh, the proverb, proverbial ghost of the mountain. Okay, just to uh, give you an opportunity to try and be an IBEX, do have a look at this picture. Uh, and this picture is special because it's one of the oldest spot the snow leopard pictures ever taken in the wild. Uh, this was photographed by uh, Dr. Chandavat, whose picture I showed earlier in 1986 in Ladakh. Now, I'll leave you guys with this picture for about 30 seconds. Try to look at it closely and uh, spot the snow leopard. If you see one, please do pat your back as you probably do qualify uh, as an Ibex that lives. Else, you need a little more training. I'm just going to be just here, just for 10, 15 seconds. Try to look look at the snow leopard. Try to find the snow leopard in the image, and I'll show you in a few seconds. Okay, that's where it is. Now, if I can try and zoom into it a little bit. That's where the snow leopard is. And the moment I zoom out, it almost melts in the back background. And that's what makes snow leopards truly the ghost of the mountain because even people who live in these mountains, they hear them uh, during the mating season, they see their footprints, they see animals killed by snow leopards, but they don't see the snow leopard. And that's, that's probably why it has earned the reputation of being called as the ghost of the mountain. All right, now no wonder uh, snow leopards are hunting machines. What you're seeing here is the movement pattern of one snow leopard hunting ibex at almost clockwork periodicity. Uh, so the ibex that you see appearing are uh, the kill sites where the snow leopard has made those kills. And the moving line in the map is uh, the data of one snow leopard. Uh, what you see below is the distance moved uh, as days progress. And this is how we are able to predict when they may have made a kill. And then the teams go and check uh, whether there's a kill or not. To top it all, this particular anim animation is of a particularly special snow leopard, which we call one eye because it has one eye. And it was injured a few months after we started following her but she continued to be an ace Ibex slayer. Her hunting prowess is a testimony to the incredible ad adaptation of snow leopards to thrive in these incredible mountains. Now it is uh, probably such high level of skill that a snow leopard must develop before moving to independence and moving about hunting and surviving in these mountains, which also probably makes them the, makes the mothers, the snow leopard mothers, the most enduring, um, enduring mothers and teachers among all cats. Now, um, yes, the cubs are incredibly cute, uh, but they also are very demanding. And for, for all the mothers out there, they have to invest a lot of time and resources on cubs. And, and the sooner the cubs become independent, the sooner uh, the mother is able to uh, go back to uh, doing things the way she is. And uh, if you see the graph here, uh, the straight line here, uh, you'll, you'll notice that even though snow leopards are smaller than most of the big cats, the mother snow leopards take care of the cubs for, the, for a period which is much longer than any other cat does. Uh, in other words, if I can just reorganize it in a way that I put the age until when a mother tends her young on y-axis and I put uh, body weight on the y on the x-axis. All every other species seems to have uh, to follow a predictable pattern where 
age at which cubs wean is related to the body weight of the cat species. Only the snow leopard tends to be an outlier to this otherwise predictable pattern. Um, anyway, uh, snow leopards live just above the tree line, uh, which, me which, make which means they live at a fairly high altitude, but they also live below altitudes that are permanently frozen uh, because above those altitudes, there's no, no prey and hence it's, uh, it's of no value for a snow leopard to be distributed above those altitudes where you have permanent snow. Uh, well, most of us know the North Pole and the South Pole. The Arctic Circle, where you find the polar bears, is the North Pole, and the cute little penguins represent what we know as the South Pole. But uh, our little blue planet uh, in the solar system also has a third pole, which is situated in Asia's high mountains. Uh, this region that you see encircled here stores 7,000 trillion liters of the planet's fresh water. It is home to 14 of the world's highest peaks and more than 100,000 square kilometers of glaciers. And no wonder why uh, it gives birth to several rivers that have mothered some of the richest of the world civilizations for millennia. In fact, even today, if you look at the, uh, the region, uh, it nurtures some of the world's most populated regions. Uh, of course, it, it, it also, uh, as you see here, it represents 12 countries. Uh, and this priceless region provides several services in addition to water. For instance, uh, you know, it sequesters carbon, determines weather patterns across many regions that, as I mentioned, have flourished over the years with human civilization. Uh, but snow leopards are found in these 12 countries, which are restricted to Asia, starting from China, Bhutan, India, all the way to Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and up uh, till Russia. So whether it's the head of a country or um, a taxi driver, one of the first questions they ask is, ah, how many snow leopards are there? Sadly, our best estimates as of now are still guesstimates. And uh, it is believed that uh, there are probably as few as 3,500 snow leopards left in the world. Just to give it a relatable uh, perspective, imagine if a snow leopard was a grain of rice, the entire world's snow leopard population would fill half of this cup. Now, to compare that with humans, imagine if each person is again a rice grain, the people of this entire world will fill up 700,000 such cups. Now that's, that is so many people and so few snow leopards. So why are there such so few of them? Um, let's spend the next few minutes exploring threats faced by snow leopards and their unique mountain habitat. A recent report by Traffic uh, predicts that uh, up to one snow leopard is likely being killed to unnatural causes every day. Uh, in fact, IUCN, uh, also the World Conservation Union, uh, classifies snow leopards as vulnerable to extinction. And to begin with, uh, all threats faced by snow leopard populations today are human induced. These do include illegal wildlife trade driven by the desire for wearing or gifting something exotic or owning something that adds to your status symbol. Uh, incidentally, unlike most other species like the tiger and rhinoceros, illegal trade in snow leopards has multiple desti destinations across the world, be it uh, Middle East, the Americas, uh, Europe, West, uh, West Asia, uh, Central Asia, or East Asia. Most snow leopards are killed opportunistically or in retaliation, uh, which is why the illegal wildlife trade is believed to be supply driven than demand driven. Uh, most common incidences of killing snow leopards take place when poor herders avenge the loss of their livelihood in the form of livestock. And uh, having said that, 
some recent trends, uh, in fact, some recent wildlife trade patterns uh, uh, have in the last three to four years have indicated that uh, uh, there could be a demand for skins as well. Now, now these, these wildlife trade patterns are dynamic and uh, the, the two or three skins that have been confiscated in, by authorities in different countries uh, over the last three, four years have indicated that now these could possibly be custom prepared in a certain way that points towards demand from some uh, Middle Eastern countries as well. So, so anyway, the point I'm trying to drive here is that wildlife trade patterns are dynamic and uh, one needs to be on top of what's happening out there in the wild. For instance, uh, a few years ago, we've suddenly started to hear instances of about incidences of uh, trophy hunting of snow leopards, even though uh, snow leopards are, it's illegal to kill snow leopards across all the countries where they're found. Um, talking about trophy hunting, uh, trophy hunting of ungulates, uh, legal trophy hunting of ungulates can be an excellent conservation tool. Uh, but the problem is few countries, uh, in fact, few places in the world manage it very well. And in most places, uh, mismanaged overhunting of ungulates leads to reduction in snow leopard prey, uh, which effectively suppresses their populations as well. Now, we all need infrastructure and economic development. Um, and uh, the problem is that when poorly planned, any infrastructure uh, not only adds avoidable risks to the investment, but it also leads to massive destruction of uh, to habitat and biodiversity. Now, given the remoteness of its habitat, uh, infrastructure development or poorly planned infrastructure, uh, to be very specific, was not even considered a threat 15 years ago. But now it is one of the most serious threats posed to snow leopards. How does it work? Uh, well, uh, poorly planned infrastructure is guilty of irreparably destroying habitats at unprecedented scales. For instance, uh, what you see here is uh, mining, uh, destroying mountains, and uh, unlike forests, mountains cannot grow back. Uh, there are also being a source of direct mortality to wildlife in the form of road kills. Now, nobody could have imagined uh, snow leopards to be a fatality to road kills, but uh, this is a recent image from a remote area where a road was recently constructed. In fact, uh, a road was recently metalled and which allowed cars to move at much faster pace than uh, they would other otherwise drive at, and uh, one casualty, as you can see right here. So, well, as if the existing th list of threats were not enough, uh, there's a recent policy advisory based on research, uh, published research that reports that people, livestock, and wildlife living in the mountains of Central and South Asia are far more uh, vulnerable to emerging infectious diseases than earlier believed. And, uh, and of course, we cannot talk about threats to snow leopards without mentioning climate change. However, climate change is not a threat, but a mother of all threats to snow leopards. The reason we call climate change the mother of all threats is because it is interacting. Earlier we were saying it will interact. Now we've changed our narrative. It is interacting. We say that it is interacting with every other threat that snow leopards are facing making it worse by a variable degree. Now, let me, let's take a slightly closer look here. Uh, what you see here are the temperature zones across the planet over the last uh, nearly 100 years. Now, we know temperatures are changing globally. In the map, white denotes normal temperatures, higher than normal temperatures are shown in red, and lower than normal temperatures you can see in blue, what you're seeing in the last 20 years, not even a long period of time, is an unprecedented change, unprecedented warming, uh, overall warming. Now, 
talking about the snow leopard, it survives between minus 40 degrees Celsius and plus 40 degrees Celsius uh, in different parts of its range at different periods of time, let's say. Uh, so what it may probably make it is less, less likely uh, or it, uh, less sensitive uh, than a coral reef to survive temperature variation over the short term. However, what will affect snow leopards is uh, how humans respond to these ch changes induced in the form of extreme events, forced changes in livelihood options, and uh, and hence greater interaction and lower acceptance. Uh, just have a look here. Now, this is a this is a satellite image of a glacier from Kyrgyzstan where I am, and actually. It's not even 50 kilometers from where I am right now. Uh, what you see here is an image from August 1994. And if you look at it, uh, the glaciers have retreated by more than a kilometer in the past 25 years. Uh, what it's going to lead to is severe problems with the availability of something as basic as water, whether it's for agriculture or drinking, or other uses. Now, we all know that climate change is increasing the frequency of extreme events, which interacts with people's well being and hence tolerance to wildlife. Now, if you look at all the threats faced by snow leopards and its ecosystem across its range, um, each of these threats are effectively interacting and amplifying. Uh, are interacting with climate change and getting amplified. Hence, I mentioned it as the mother of all threats. Now, just to give you another intriguing perspective, uh, we know glaciers are already melting at an unprecedented rate. We just saw an image. Um, imagine what pathogens these uh, glaciers, which have remained frozen for millennia, are going to bring down with them. Now, with people getting pushed closer to remote areas uh, due to unpredictable and rapidly changing weather conditions, uh, climate change is going to lead people to more conflict with snow leopard as a direct consequence, which coupled with poorly planned infrastructure is going to drive up poaching and illegal wildlife trade as well. So there's, 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 this, there's this awful convergence of infectious diseases uh, with linear infrastructure development in what used to be once inaccessible habitats. And then they're interacting with illegal wildlife trade. And of course, all's happening in the ages of climate change. So I just, just, just wanted to highlight uh, how, uh, how threats to biodiversity are often very closely connected to each other and hence interactive rather than linear and uh, straightforward predictable. So, just to add, these threats do not have only affect snow leopards or biodiversity. They have a cascading impact on us, our well being, and our livelihoods as well. I'll just give you one more example. This is Kaneki. Her family lives in the Tian Shan Mountains and makes a small income of nearly $2,500 per year. But if I tell you that Kaneki and her family receives ecosystem services such as water, fodder, fuel, and several other commod commodities whose market value is, let's say about $18,000, she gets it all from nature, free of cost, that, that will surprise you. Now, where does this, she get this from? And I'll just uh, show you one more example here. Now, although the numbers look startling, Here's a slightly more pra practical, pragmatic example. Most of you may have heard of Kashmir. Uh, Kashmir is an expensive wool produced from uh, very specialized goats um, and jackets and shawls made for it, made of Kashmir sell at about 300 to $400 per kilogram to the end user, notwithstanding that the herder who produces Kashmir who owns these Kashmir goats gets less than 10% of this value. But the point being that uh, these uh, end products, I'm not even, in, I'm just putting the value that it may cost in terms of weight, not even counting the craftsmanship and shipping and other costs there. 
Now, our, our researcher, in fact, a, a colleague of ours, Dr. Ranjini Murli, when she was, uh, she investigated this, uh, the ecosystem services, uh, she found that the cost to nature for producing that one kilogram cashmere, uh, which is being sold at the, uh, as an end product for 300 to $400, is 500 to $700 per kilogram. Now, none of us are paying that cost. And, uh, but we know someone is paying that cost. As of now, it's nature. And if any product is going out with, uh, at a loss, there's a certain level only till where you can go with it. And uh, we all know there are no free lunches, uh, which is why it's, uh, it's probably understandable to believe that the floods, forest fires, cyclones, extreme winters, landslides, the recent pandemic, uh, it, it's fair enough to even consider them as nature's payback. Okay, so yeah, that's uh, as far as the bad news goes. What do we do to conserve snow leopards? How do we address these threats, which are constantly changing, which are constant, which are so dynamic? Uh, we follow a four-pronged approach, and at the bottom of it is the fact that there's no when you're working with wildlife conservation, there's no exit strategy. You have to be there invested for the long term. Uh, so what we do is we invest in research to understand what snow leopards, uh, to understand snow leopards, its prey and its habitat. Uh, we also try to understand the socioeconomics, attitudes and situation analysis among the local communities that are interfacing with snow leopards. And we assess and monitor changes over time. So that's part one research. To conserve snow leopards, what we do is we partner with the local communities that share their spaces with wildlife. And uh, the reason we, we, we do that and we must do that, you might remember Bayard's example uh, and further research, what it has led to led us to believe, uh, led us to understand, realize is that less than 5% of the protected areas in the snow leopard range are big enough to encompass a viable snow leopard population. Uh, what it basically does is it makes the local communities an essential stakeholder and a partner in conserving snow leopards. So what we do is we work on a range of programs that help offset the damage to livelihood and incentivizes uh, tolerance and acceptance to the presence of snow leopards. Um, through rain, uh, rewarding rangers for a better for better performance uh, in the field, or by working with the, the women in communities to produce, uh, pro make uh, uh, handicraft produce which are sold at in the international markets, and return all the profits uh, if they are able to protect areas that they have defined for, by themselves. So that's the conservation part. Now we do learn, which is research and we conserve, but it's easy for this connection, uh, for its connection with the snow leopards to be lost and to maintain the conservation connection and build a broader consist constituency for snow leopards. We do work uh, with the wider audience, be it children, women, local communities, as well as, in as international audience such as yourselves in building awareness and imparting education about the plight of snow leopard. I mean, at the end of the day, let's, let's admit it. Uh, snow leopards cannot vote. Uh, for if, if there's a policy coming or if there's an investment going in an area which is going to be detrimental to their habitat, it's, it's, it's the people who are able to uh, take action and uh, uh, and lobby for them. So in other words, we're trying to work to develop a constituency for snow leopards. At the end of the day, anybody from any profession, be it uh, any profession or any country can make a difference by making the right choices, you know, be it switching off an extra light bulb or avoiding, in fact, reporting someone selling illegal wildlife products. Everyone can and does play a very important role in conserving uh, biodiversity not for someone else, but for ourselves. So, so far so good. Uh, we can learn through research, we can conserve through building partnerships with communities, we can educate through various means, but these are at best localized small scale efforts. To 
conserve a species that is distributed across 2 million square kilometers. You might remember I showed you earlier and 12 countries. What you need is, what we need is to scale all of this research, conservation and education plan into policy. And uh, from 2013 onwards, uh, we have, uh, we are a close ally in a unique initiative led by the Kyrgyz government, which is called the Global Snow Leopard and Ecosystem Protection Program. This initiative is unique in bringing together governments of all the 12 snow leopard range countries on a platform to jointly endorse uh, the Bishkek Declaration for Snow Leopard Conservation. And believe it or not, this is the first time governments of these 12 countries have come together on a single platform, yes, to discuss snow leopard conservation um, uh, and conservation of these unique mountains. And, and the Bishkek Declaration emphasizes the value of cooperation and collaboration, not just between the range countries, but between um, non-governmental and multilateral expertise. Uh, as of now, uh, not just these 12 countries, but more than 30 organizations collaborate uh, and are working together to achieve the goals of the Bishkek Declaration that I mentioned before. Now, just to give you a hint of how it's helping implement or how, how it's really helping, I'm just going to give you one small example of how this collaboration is achieving uh, what had earlier been considered impossible. And to do that, I'm going to come back to the snow leopard numbers. You remember, I used the word guesstimate for snow leopard abundance. Now, despite years of research, uh, in fact, decades of research, we haven't been able to find, figure how many snow leopards are there in the world, uh, primarily due to technological uh, limitations, but also due to lack of um, convening power to be able to coordinate something at this scale. 2 million square kilometers is not a small area. 12 countries is not a small number of countries to work uh, and coordinate an activity in. Uh, but here, uh, through an enormous collaboration, um, we, the population assessment of the world's snow leopards, in fact, if you make it short, it, you can call it pause. Uh, it's coordinating efforts across 12 countries to not only estimate how many snow leopards are there, but also identify excuse me, where they are and what are the key threats that their populations face. The initiative relies heavily on capacity building, uh, training and scientific innovation to deliver what we hope could be the first ever statistically robust global, regional and national snow leopard uh, estimates. And a, a testimony to this success has been uh, can be seen uh, from a mere 2% of the snow leopard uh, range being covered by uh, reliable, uh, reliable methods uh, in 2017, and the number growing 400% uh, from 2% to now roughly 10% of the snow leopard range uh, is covered with pause compliance surveys. And given the design, uh, statistical design and robust uh, methods being used, hopefully uh, with a little more effort, we might be in a position to provide uh, the global estimates in a year's time. Now, sharing of best practices and experiences and constant access to expertise across international borders uh, has allowed this pause initiative uh, to help improve our knowledge uh, so that it can lead to informed decision-making. And I'm not exaggerating, but none of this would have been possible had it not been this global platform and coordination, uh, which allowed us to make these uh, make this effort. In fact, it allowed us to even consider that this could be remotely possible. So with that, I'd like to Thank you all once again for enduring me for this rather longish talk about snow leopards. I'll be happy to answer any questions if you have. And uh, in case I'm unable to answer any of your questions, uh, please still reach out to us and we will be able to connect you to the 
other experts uh, from our team to answer uh, those questions that I may not be able to answer. Thank you. Hoping you were able to hear me all right. Uh, so the current population estimate, uh, Panos, is somewhere between 3,500 to 7,000 individuals. Um, having said that, we have made a lot of progress. We know for sure in Mongolia, the population is uh, has been estimated using uh, sophisticated methods last year and they suspect there could be somewhere between 900 to 1,000 snow leopards there. Um, but other countries are catching up quickly and we will have nice uh, uh, replicable and reliable estimates coming in soon. Uh, okay, uh, let me quickly go through. Uh, highest density, uh, that's a good question. So uh, as of now, we know based on the data that we already have, we suspect the highest density as of now is in uh, in an area called Sarichatar Tash Reserve in Kyrgyzstan. We we are, we are yet to receive estimates from some other potential sites which could have a greater density. But as of now, uh, based on the methods that we can rely on, um, the Sarichatar Tash Reserve in southeast Kyrgyzstan seems to have the, the highest density. Um, uh, yes, please. Caroline Royce is asking if you if you'll be presenting again. I'm just telling her that you're going to be recording, but she's got your details, so she can contact you as well. Of course, absolutely, absolutely. Please uh, feel free. In fact, if you, uh, yeah, you have my contact, so do do reach out. I should yeah. mention is my it... email ID as well, but yeah, should be easy for you to reach reach out to me. Thank you. And then somebody asked about how many in captivity. Right. So legally, uh, and the reason I mentioned legally is because there are a lot of uh, illegally kept pets, um, which we don't know about. Uh, some of you may have seen the documentary, which came out a couple of years ago, and uh, the malpractices around captive, uh, you know, illegally breeding uh, big cats. But legally speaking, uh, legally in, uh, in, in zoos and uh, zoos accredited by the, uh, by the World Association of Zoos and Aquariums, they expect somewhere around 500 to 550 snow leopards uh, in the conservation breeding program. So, and these are spread across the world from the US, uh, North America, uh, Europe, Japan, India. So m multiple countries are part, are part of this global snow leopard uh, conservation breeding program uh, in, in, in zoos and aquariums. Um, Dan Gorlin asks, what type of incentives are offered to herders, communities to deter reprisals against snow leopards? So it it really is a, a, is extremely dynamic because you know the way we work we we don't go as a uh, go to the communities with a solution we go to them we uh, you know when I mentioned partners partner actually also it's it's an acronym P stands for presence A stands for aptness R uh, T N E R they all stand for specific terms which jointly make the partnership work. So the whole idea of working with the communities is to first identify where the problem is and accordingly figure out what could be the best solution. Just to give you an example, in one part of India, livestock insurance is a, is a very successful program where a locally owned community-driven insurance program uh, it, it softens the blow when snow leopards kill livestock once in a while in the mountains. The same program completely would fail if it would be copy pasted in another community where the threat is slightly different. The snow leopards do not 
hunt livestock or do not kill livestock in the pastures, they come in the corrals and kill them there. So if you do insurance in a corral, then in one night, your entire insurance uh, premium will be exhausted because once a snow leopard gets into a corral, they get into this killing frenzy and kill can kill up to 30, 40, even 60 uh, livestock in a night. So in those communities, then we work with them to create predator proofing of corrals. Um, shift to Mongolia, we work there with the communities to, to help improve their livelihood in a way uh, that, uh, you know, through those products that I mentioned about, where it provides them with additional, um, additional income, which offsets the losses that they are uh, undertaking because of, because of living and tolerating snow leopards. So it's really, I, I wish I had a single answer, but it isn't a, a, you know, a, a one solution fits all kind of a, an issue. In Pakistan, we, we work with communities for vaccination because we realize that they lose a lot more livestock to, uh, to diseases, which eventually reduces their tolerance to, to uh, uh, to any incidence of uh, depredation. So if their livestock is healthy, fewer of them are dying, they tolerate a few losses uh, to depredation. So it really varies. It really is dynamic. It's really case to case, on, on case to case basis where what solutions work. And in, in almost 100% of these sites where at least we work, we try to co-evolve the solutions. Uh, we share what's happening elsewhere and then, you know, the communities are, are, are uh, you know, community com uh, uh, joint wisdom of a community is always bigger than what any of us can individually bring in. And when we come up with those solutions, yep, they've been working successfully. Um, Jane Harrison asks, do you test dead snow leopards found for evidence of COVID exposure or other pathogens? or test sample of the prayer population? Uh, sadly, we've not found us found any, I mean, it's very difficult to find dead snow leopards. They, I imagine it's difficult to see a live snow leopard and the dead snow leopard wouldn't be moving at all and it'll be just so very well camouflaged. Uh, but uh, no, we haven't found any, any dead snow leopards with, uh, uh, with uh, COVID, with COVID. Having said that, uh, there's a very nice paper, you uh, if you want, I can forward it to you, where our research team investiga investigated uh, pathogens in snow leopards uh, in, in one of the sites in South Gobi. And they did find more than 60 pathogens, in, including a different strain of uh, COVID. So the animals do have... Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, they are repositories of of uh, uh, of diseases. They can be repositories as well. I'll, I'll be happy to share. Yeah. If you send it to me, I can have it loaded onto our website. I will. I will. In fact, you must. Uh, I, I must also share the policy advisory that I talked about, which talks about the greater risk the region faces to. Uh, to zoonos zoonotic diseases, uh, even that has some very interesting assessments and uh, uh, and predictions. So yeah, and and that also mentions this other research that I was talking about. Okay, so if you send those papers to us, I'll have Happy. it loaded as well as the Happy. recording. And then people are asking sure. for your Instagram. I th I suspect it's right there on the screen. It's I know, on the screen. I suspect that some people don't have access to a screen. They might just be watching. I don't. Ah, know. Okay. So my my Instagram is uh, K O U S T U B H S H A R M A. My name with no spaces, no no numerics is my Instagram account. On Twitter, it's the same thing. Just there's an underscore between my first name and the second name. If you search, you'll find there are not many costumes working on snow leopards. Okay. <laughs> I think that's all. I'm going to bring Valerie in. And let's just, well, we'll just call her an, an end. Sure. Well, Dr. Dr. Sharma, thank you very much for a brilliant lecture. Wonderful, wonderful um, film with everything. Really enjoyed it. Thank so you. informative. 
Thank you thank very you. much indeed. And thank I'm sure so everybody well. agrees with me. <laughs> yeah, and from thank you for giving me the opportunity. Thank you. Well, and then from my end, thank you very much as well. It was, uh, it, as you can see from the comments which you're reading yourself, it's really been really well received. So thank you. Um, thank you. I think there's some people still trying to come in, but it's a bit late. But there will be a recording for those who have uh, not managed to come in. I will be sharing the recording um, and we're going to be uploading it onto our website. Sure. Thank you. Thank and you so much. I think one of your colleagues, Dr. Gabi, I think he, he might have been having some connectivity issues. So I'll be sharing the talk with him as well. <laughs> <laughs> Sure. Okay, so as I don't know if there's anything anybody I think we've got everything a uh, well, great presentation, thank you for your efforts of saving these beautiful animals, beautiful creatures, thank you learn so much so we're getting some really fabulous and positive feedback which I think will be continued to be enjoyed when once we load your presentation onto our website. Yes. So again, many thanks for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you for thank having you me. Very thank you. Again. Such a pleasure. Brilliant. Very nice talking to you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Bye -bye. Thank you. Be well. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.